Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Straight Off The Bat, a Facebook Live series from the Bankers Association of Trinidad and Tobago. It is a show that covers the need to revive, survive, and adapt to the new normal of COVID-19. Today, we're going to cover some topics that, you know, it's going to be Black Friday just now and then Cyber Monday. And I know you guys are going on Amazon. Do even get me started. I know you are on Amazon and you're prepping for those who can't afford it, you know, buying presents for people. Uh, so you want to stick around for the next hour because we're going to have a really great conversation with Antonio from RBC about some of the things that you need to look out for, especially uh, for a lot of us who are shifting across to online banking for the first time as well. He has some great insights into what you need to know about setting up your account. Before we start, make sure to smash that subscribe button because you need to be notified every time we have these discussions because financial education and literacy is something that we all need to know because or need to grow on because you're never uh, too old to continue to learn and some of us didn't necessarily have parents to sit down and be like, this is what you need to do. I know it's not their fault, but this is just how it is. <laughs> yeah. So stick around because we're always uh, in looking forward to your feedback to look at future guests. So we're going to welcome Antonio into the mix. Uh, and we have a bit of we had a little bit of a technical difficulty setting up, um, you know, through security, you know. <laughs> uh, but we have him and we welcome him to our session today. Good morning, Antonio. I feel like you are a pro at this. We've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's see, let, let's put it this way. You should always be prepared. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, we had a little bit of technical difficulties. It's fine. We're over the hurdle. I think uh, the content that you have to bring to your table is so important. Um, you know, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to put aside that we don't have the perfect lighting right now, but I think everybody can hear you. Um, for the folks out there, if there's any audio problems, just slide into the comments and we will make the necessary changes. So Antonio, just give, uh, the folks out there a brief insight into, uh, what do you do? Okay, well, um, I am the manager of corporate investigations at RBC Royal Bank. Um, my unit of our portfolio covers the length and breadth of the Caribbean. So we, we don't only see about Trinidad and Tobago, but we also see about all of the other islands where there's an RBC footprint. I'm also a um, serving member of the ECFP, and I'm also on the Interbank anti fraud Committee. That's um, a committee that, that's set up on the batch where we meet on a bi-monthly basis to discuss issues um, or um, circumstances affecting the institutions and how to make plans to, to get around these things. Wow, so you have a wealth of knowledge that spans beyond Trinidad and Tobago, which is going to definitely be important for us to have these discussions. Uh, for those who are now joining us, thank you for, for being here. And we are talking about internet fraud, which has such a broad range of topics. Uh, so I want us to delve right into it. We did have some discussions uh, previously, if you've missed it. We had a live session, session with Antonio about fraud, uh, more along the lines of, you know, commercial perspective, looking at checks. And it was quite interesting what you mentioned on social engineering. If you want to learn more about that, make sure to head over to our live videos after this session because you don't want to miss this. Uh, so let's talk about online banking, right? Because we don't like lines. Nobody, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just me, guys, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but nobody likes lines, right? And especially now, you know, we don't want to have to put on masks, be sanitized to the point where your skin is crackling because it needs moisture. Um, instead, we want to be able to access our money online and be able to pay bills online. So it's a lot of people now shifting across for the first time in online banking, what is the first piece of advice you would tell somebody who is now entering into the world of online banking? Okay, so online banking, it, it could be intimidating if you're not prepared to be open to it. But nonetheless, that is the direction that all of the banks are heading in, and not just Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean, throughout the entire world, right? So everything is more or less digital. 
So each bank would have a digital space, a digital footprint in terms of um, providing the, the needs to the customers. So online banking is exactly that. It gives you access to your accounts. It gives you access to your information at the click of a phone or the click of a computer. It is very convenient. You no longer have to get up, get dressed, bathe, go in the traffic, line up in the bank, right? It could happen as you open your eyes. It could happen just before you close your eyes to go to bed. However, just as how the, the banks are making life convenient for their customers, the fraudsters are very aware as well of the online banking platforms. They know, as a matter of fact, processors may have accounts in the banks, and some of them may open accounts in banks so as to understand the online banking space, so as to more or less develop or perpetrate their crime in, in relation to any loopholes that they may seem or they may deem um, um, ex existing. Nonetheless, what I would advise customers in terms of your online banking, make sure that you know the steps. The key thing here is to understand what are the steps you take to do your transactions. You need to understand exactly what function your online banking platform gives you. If it gives you a function to transfer funds from your account to your account, if it gives you the option of transferring funds from your bank to another bank, if it gives you the option of transferring funds from your bank to another, another jurisdiction. So once you understand what are the functions that you have? You then have to make sure to understand the step for each function, right? And I say that because if you do not understand the various steps, step one, step two, step three, step four, right? You may find that because of the skill of the fraudster, because that they may be more familiar with the digital space, they could intervene in those transactions and more or less redirect you in the directions that they want you to go so they could perpetrate the fraud against you. It is important as well as far as, I'm con uh, as far as I know, each institution has what you call the two-factor authentication. And to date, the fraudsters have not been able to get around that. So your, your online banking is definitely secure, and it is a safe, safe space for you to do your transactions. So it's one of those situations where, you know, sometimes you get a new electronics and you're just trying to start it up on your you kind of pelt away the manual because you're like, I'll figure it out. You're basically telling us, no, you have to read the manual before you even start because then you're going to catch yourself into trouble, basically. Well, the manual, may, the manual may exist in terms of the device that you're using. But in terms of the online blanking platform, obviously your bank will give you directions or instructions as how to deal with that. Each institution will have what you call a, an advice center. Those are the people you call 24-7. And they are very versed in terms of treating with these, these, these types of questions. So it is nothing intimidating. It is, it is, sometimes it is so simple. You yourselves will be able to say, my God, this thing has been so simple. I've been, I've been going through all this stress for all this while trying to do my banking. And here it is, they made it so simple at the click of a, at the click of a, of a button, right? So the, the key thing is to understand the steps involved in doing your transactions. What I need to do first, what I need to do second, what I need to do third, what I, what I need to do fourth, and once you follow those steps as directed by the bank, you're good to go. If, however, somewhere in there, something happens in, in a way that, for example, what the process like may, may attempt to do is they may intervene. If they see you online, they may intervene in that transaction and trying to, trying to get you to give them your code, as the case may be. Right? Once you see something like that happening, you just need to abort the transaction and contact your bank immediately. But nonetheless, with the two-factor authentication process, security process in, in space. That has taken care of all of that. So your digital banking is very safe. Can you elaborate on the, the two-factor authentication? What, what does that look like? All right. So, so when you hear two-factor, it means that you have to do, use two measures of security to get access to your, 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 your function, your online banking. More than likely, one of, those, one, of, one, of the, one of the factors would be your password. And the other factor would be a digital code you would have received from the bank or a device the bank gave you in terms of your, your to, to present that to open your account. There's something called, um, a lot of banks use Entrust, where the, the provider provides you with an electronic code. So you, you log on, you go online, you, you put in your password, you put in your, your identification number, you know, it then asks you for that code. That particular which is electronic, which will be, be given to you personally. 
you would then take that four digit code or eight digit code as the case may be, put it onto your platform, click enter, and that would take you into the space now where you could now process your transactions. Right now, if it, if you take too long to put in that code, that is okay because the code keeps changing over and over. I think it's every 30 seconds or every minute, the code keeps changing over and over. So whatever code is appearing on your device at the time, you use that four digit code to get into your banking um, digital space to process a transaction. So when you hear two factor authentication, it simply means you have to use two measures of security to get access to your, your, your function. It sounds, it could sound uh, somewhat overwhelming for some people, but I just want to remind everybody out there, I prefer this than sign up in a line. So, uh, you know, stick stick with us. <laughs> I feel like we're taking you down the right direction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Good morning to everybody, because everybody's, like, sliding and saying morning. Thanks for your question, Natasha. Unfortunately, this session is not bank-focused, so I think you need to head over to um your specific bank with your question as it relates to our q a just stick around for the last 15 minutes we will ask and drill antonio on all the questions that you may have so antonio when it comes to passwords right because we are living in a world where there's so many to remind re like you have to remember so many passwords um it's easy as humans to take the easy route and do things that include your name, you know, um, even your date of birth, which to me, that doesn't even seem to be a, a secure option either. Or um, uh, some folks may have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can't even believe that I'm saying this, but there was a report that said that that was actually one of the most popular um uh passwords as well as the 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 year so can you give us some insights um of what not to do uh <laughs> because i feel like we need to start there okay um no, no passwords are important right almost every aspect of life now any every aspect of digital life now you must have a password as a matter of fact most of us have passwords even to open our phones right so open your computer there's a password depending on the type of door you have to enter your home, there could be a code or a password. So passwords are very important, it's part of life. However, we need to understand that there are things that you should not use to develop your password. For example, as you said, your date of birth, right? Your car number, your telephone number, and that sort of common information, information that you would find on somebody's profile. So if you go on somebody's profile and Facebook or some social media site, do not use any information that you have on your profile to develop your password, right? Because you may have some issues that people may be able to figure it out depending on how you are, who you are. And I'll give an example. I spoke to someone just recently and they were able to tap into the neighbor's um, Wi-Fi and they never asked the neighbor for their password, right? They just knew that the neighbor had a favorite grandchild and they almost sure that that password, the, the grandchild's name would be the password, and so said so. Then they tried it once, and they got through. So password should not be something too familiar with you. Um, you shouldn't use anything too familiar with your, your living space, right? Like your, your name, your date of birth, and that sort of thing. Um, now, they are, the first, so the hackers have something what you call like um, a, a, um, a app or alphabet hacker type of device where, they, where once they have access to your device, once they planted that application on your device, that malware on your device, it could eventually figure out your password, right? And these things are designed for that particular purpose. And it may not, it may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, it may take them some time, but they could eventually figure out what your password is by using these rogue applications. So um, what I would advise folks to do in terms of your password, According to the experts, um, an 11 character password, 11 digit character password is the better type of password to have. So your password should have at least 11 characters in it. Those characters should include capital letters, common letters, numbers, and certain symbols, okay? Now, personally, what I like to recommend is that you could use like a phrase. A password doesn't necessarily have to be a word. It doesn't have to be something that you put together that's not making sense. Because if you put things together that's not making sense, it may be difficult for you to remember unless you write it down. And that itself is a risk, right? Your password 
could be a phrase. I like to recommend use a phrase. For example, Brian Lara is the best. Okay? Jack and Jill went up the hill. All those phrases, all those phrases that you like, things that you remember. I enjoy curry, all those things. And with that, with those words, you create that phrase into one word. And not, not only would you use that, you will now change certain things in that word. For example, all of, all of the letter A or the letters Y or Z, you may now change that to a numerical. So for example, so if you have if if you have a B in your password, you could use that B as the number seven. So anywhere there's a B in that password, you have seven. Then you may create spaces between the words. There are so many things that you could do to design your own password. However, but I think using a phrase is the safest thing because there may not be any application out there that could decipher that in, a, in, a, in an easy form or fashion. So a phrase, designing that phrase to suit you, you could use that as your password. And you and you alone would know that password. For me, I um, that, that's great advice for, for those out there for sure. And I actually, I read that somewhere what you what you just mentioned and I think it's great advice. But what I do is I, uh, I created like a goal, a personal goal of mine that I've never shared with anybody before. And I put that as my password, as you mentioned, and put these symbols and the numbers because usually my goals have numbers attached to it. Um, and it not only helps with remembering the password, but it reminds me of my dreams and aspirations. I know it's kind of lame, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you're killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's yes. what Very good, it very helps. good, Polly. Very good, yes. Uh, so let's talk about um, what the trends are out there. Karen, I saw your question. We'll come back to it at the end, uh, the last 15 minutes, we'll do a Q&A. But what are these, some of the scams that you are aware of? So our last session, we spoke about social engineering because a lot of folks are looking at, you know, joining dating apps because they can't socialize uh, as before. And if you haven't seen that, guys, make sure and check it out in the video section for Facebook. But what are some of the things out there that people should be mindful of? Okay, so I would I would make sure and this this answer would be more or less bringing the I'm bringing the answer home to Trinidad and Tobago in terms of what I see affecting Trinidadians on a daily basis. Now, I think in the last session we would have covered a certain measure of it, but to go a little deeper now is to say that what we are seeing, Pauline, it could be heart wrenching in the sense that people are losing their hard earned money. The mature persons who may have, who are home and who have resigned and have the nest egg, they are losing their hard-earned money. We have pensioners out there who are online just for the sole purpose of not being alone. They are targets and, and losing their money. Now, the scams we're seeing would involve, now you mentioned social media, social engineering, sorry. Now, you, you must understand that social engineering forms part of every almost every fraud typology there's an element of social engineering in that fraud typology and social engineering in that context means to get your the first gets him, himself into your space and get you to trust them to develop that trust between you and them now you need to understand something i th i think the last time i mentioned and i would say it now that if you're having a relationship with someone online from the moment that person brings a financial transaction into the relationship or into the conversation, 9.99% of the times, that's related to fraud one way or the other, okay? Now, someone may ask themselves, well, okay, I'm, I've been chatting with this person for three months. I've been chatting with this person for six months. I've been chatting with this person for a year and a half, two years, and they've never asked me to do a transaction for them or anything financial. Lo and behold, 36 months into the relationship, they bring a financial transaction into the into the picture. So you, at that stage, you, be, you, you, you already sold hook, line, and sinker in terms of the relationship. Your emotions may be involved in that relationship by that time. However, you have to bear in mind, and I guarantee you, you're not the only one that they love with. You're not the only one that they're speaking to. While they're chatting with you, they're just cutting and, cut and pasting their messages and sending it at least... 4,500 other people. They could be focusing on 10,000 people. So they have, they, they, they're busy and they, they, they communicate with everyone on a regular basis. So while they may, st while, while they may have befriended you on the 1st of January, they may, be, they may have befriended 40 people on the 1st of January and they're going on the road in terms of 
socializing these people, social engineering their way into your space. So it's not a case of them having to get to you two days after they, they, they befriended you or added you to the, the friend list. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It could take months, it could take weeks, it could take years, right? Because they are working on other people in the, in the, in the meantime. The key thing to remember is from the moment they bring a financial transaction into that conversation, nine of the 10 times, it is fraud related. So what the, the typology that we've seen as affecting Trinbagonians is one where people are being befriended on social media, the social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, as the case may be, they are being befriended there. What you find happening, they will then escalate that conversation or communication on WhatsApp, on some so, so sort of social media site where they could speak to you instantly through your phone or, 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 um, as opposed to your computer, right? Or uh, a, a situation where they have your telephone number or you have their telephone number so they could communicate with you much faster. During that conversation, they will have a normal, typical day-to-day -day conversation. They will send you pictures of themselves, their grandchildren, their dog, their, their, their fish in the fish tank home, everything to make, to make it nice and dandy. And one day, out of the blue, they would mention that financial situation to you. Or what they, what they will do to you is say to you, Pauline, because of our relationship, because of our friendship, because of how I feel about you, I'm sending you a gift. And they will send you a picture, Pauline, that has all of the good stuff in it. If it's a woman, they will send you a picture of a handbag, shoes, jewelry, telephone, watches. If it's a man, they will send items that will attract the male person. And they would say to you, I, have, I, I already sent these items to you. Somebody will contact you in terms of when they, when they get to Trinidad or Tobago, someone will contact you. The broker will contact you to come and collect your items. Lo and behold, Pauline, remember they have your telephone number. You would get a telephone call from somebody purporting to, to be from one, one of the um, service providers who do these things, who, who bring items into the country. You're going to get a phone call and they're purporting that they are from this place and there's a package here in your name, and you need to provide X amount of dollars to clear that package. By that time, Pony, what we've seen, people are so excited to get this gift, this very expensive gift, that they go ahead and pay, maybe online, for or, 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 or credit funds an account for to collect their package. Now, understand this. The fraud typology doesn't it doesn't just work in, in one stream. There's about three or four streams of this fraud running parallel to each other. The other stream is that they need some, someone who has a bank account. Now, just a, a little side a, a, to drift a bit. Having a bank account now, one one does not have, to have money in the bank account now to be of value to the fraudster. Once you have a bank account in any financial institution, you are of value to a fraudster, right? So. What we, see, what we see happening is that they would tell this person who is so in love and who is now befriended and who's looking forward to this expensive package to take X amount of dollars and credit it to this particular account in a particular bank. Now, while they were befriending you, they were also befriending that person. And that person now has been caught in the, in the, in the web of trying to assist this person that they're now so, so affectionate and, and close to. And they would say to that person, X amount of money will be credited to your account and you just go and take with that money and do X, Y, and Z with it. So here it is now. Your package is waiting for you and you get a call from the courier service saying to you, I have this package here for you. Please come and collect it. Now, at some point in time, you will, there will be some delay and you will, you will get a contact call from the fraudster saying to you, um, Pauline, there's a slight problem. What I didn't tell you is that I put cash also in that package for you. Apart from the expensive gifts, there's also cash. The figure that they tend to um, relate to you is usually impressive, like a 10,000 pounds or 10,000 US or 10,000 euro or 15,000 euro. We saw an instance where they said they had 20,000 euro cash in the, in the package for the person. They would say to you, that the cash was discovered and the authorities are now looking at it and it may go down the road of anti-money laundering investigations. By that time, Pauline, you are scared. 
because here it is you're, you, you're thinking of that your name jumping up in this police investigation as it relates to financial fraud right so they will say to you do not worry about it too much just that same account that you were crediting the funds to to collect a gift just go there and put x amount of money in that account and we will take that and settle that aml issue for you that 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 online that um anti-money laundering issue for you and people being so scared poorly they tend to follow these things these instructions until they realize wait there's no package there's nothing coming their way and they're just losing the money i could i could mention an instance to you of a very elderly person who would have lost over $120,000 in this scam, in this country, right? So it is very prevalent. And um, that is what we see you now in that particular space. When it comes to internet scams, that's the end thing for, tri for, for Trinbegonians to be cautious and mindful of. Oh gosh, that hurt my heart. Oh gosh. <laughs> I had the mic on mute, but I was like, oh no, because I can't imagine they hard on money, you know? Um, yes. It, it's god it's so sad and so I, I when i look at the the influx of users on facebook because every you know social media tiktok is is a new young people thing but you're actually seeing a huge um audience uh over 60 that are now joining the platform so as you mentioned before you know looking for companionship as you get older and um going online to see what your grandchildren may be doing maybe they're across wherever uh what advice would you give to um <laughs> children of these parents who are trying to um prevent their parents from falling into a trap right because you have some parents who want to be on their own want to do their own thing you know um and want to live alone uh, they may ask you to set up the account, but then they want to obviously create their own um, persona and stuff online. Is there any tools or um, suggestions, maybe give us one or two suggestions of a, a, a child of that individual to help them at least avoid or try to avoid them being caught in such some of these scams? Okay, so now... You're correct. Um, most of the elderly folks who are on these platforms are there because of companionship, right? There's an there's a never-ending conversation in the social media space. There's a never-ending conversation, right? You could you could talk the whole day, right? And that's what they want. They want company. And then what you find some folks they are so excited now to have this device where they could even speak to their children because in most instances the reason they have the device in the first place is so that they could communicate with their children or their grandchildren who are miles away, but they could do so in real time, right? Now, being in that space, right, they may then, someone may target them, communicate with them, and then try and befriend them to the extent where they would bring a financial transaction into the picture or the issue of a gift. So what I would do, there's, no, you could, you could, on, on these social media sites, you could block accounts, right? You could report accounts and you could block accounts. But there is, you, you could also make it private to the extent where you could only communicate with family members, right? So I would say that you could probably want to set up your, your, your parameters in that way, right? Um, advise your parents to make sure you, you, you restrict your friendship to family. If you want to go outside of that, you then speak to your parents and let them know that, hey, from the moment that person you're speaking to, if there's any type of communication, whether you solicited it or not, whether they, from the moment they bring a financial transaction into that conversation, or if from the moment they, they say that they want to send you a gift or that sort of thing, contact um, contact me right away, mommy and daddy, so I could talk to you and, and guide you through that. Or from the moment that person brings that into the picture, just block that person or just delete them. Or make sure report it to the, your, your children so they would know exactly okay what's going on because the younger ones may have a better understanding of what's happening and be able to explain that to, to the older heads to protect them because i'm telling you uh, um we i we've seen a lot of retired professionals becoming victims of these things for the sake of being lonely gosh that's heartbreaking um guys out there Call your parents. <laughs> I'm going to call my mom after this. 
Um, uh, it's that is yeah. Um, thanks to Ad as Adi Ines King. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. He gave some suggestions on um how to make your password stronger. It's it's a cool idea. So check it out in the comments. Um, so let's let's look at what's gonna happen over the next couple of weeks, which is uh, purchasing is going to skyrocket, right? So you have a lot of sales that are happening. Um, some folks would be on social media. You now have that pay button where you have global shipping. And uh, you see a lot of um, uh, these shipping companies are quite busy, you know, because people are preempting for the sales and Christmas shopping. Is there anything in particular that you want to tell our audience that we should be mindful of when we are doing online shopping? Okay, so the mere fact we're talking online shopping, that means to say you have to go to a particular web page, right? You have to go to a particular website. So look for the items to shop to, to, to more or less digitally window shop to see what items you, you want to purchase and to cart those items and to, or to, to and get them to you. Now, the key thing here is to understand that you need to make sure that that particular site is safe. Now, not all of us, the majority of us, the greater percentage of us are not tech savvy or IT inclined, right? So we may not be able to look at a web page and say, okay, this looks safe, or this doesn't look safe as the case may be. However, our understanding is, and even from our, this, the standard of the, of the internet, what, once you see a website with that's the, the, the way the, in the, URL, the URL speaks is HTTPS, the S being for secure, and then you see the, um, a symbol of a lock next to it, that is considered a safe site to shop on, right? The S is for secure, and the symbol of the lock indicates that this is a safe site to shop on. If you see HTTP only, while that site may exist, it does exist, it may not have the security measures of the site that has HTTPS, the web page that has HTTPS on it. So look for the web pages that has HTTPS and the lock in the or by the browser when you when you open the page, when you open the site, at, at the top where you normally where you could um put in your addresses as the case may be to 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 to, to come to the site. Look for that HTTPS and the lock symbol. Now, you will also find on those web pages, at the bottom of those pages, you will see contact information. You may also see symbols like um, you may see a private policy type um, attachment at the bottom there. Those things are also indicators that the site may be safe. Now, although you may see all of those things at the bottom that speaks to the policy, that, that shows um, contact information, private policy issues, and all sort of certificates, right? You may still be wondering, I wonder how safe is this site, right? So you need to make sure that when you go onto those type of sites, what you may have to look out for in terms of if the site could be considered a bit um, unsecure, right? You may have pop-ups, right, coming at you with outlandish claims, right, indicating that you either want something or if you click on this link, right, you could expect this or oh, thank you for shopping here and that sort of thing, right? So you find that sites that are usually safe, you would you may not have that type of pop-up taking place, right? that kind of that kind of activity. So that's that's one of the measures. But to to, to make it as simple as possible, sites that where you see the HTTPS and the lock in the browser, you are more than likely you could consider those sites pretty safe and that's you could go on those um, sites and do your shopping. What about the social media website shopping? Do you have an opinion on that? Like what should we be looking for? Because the ease of that shop button sometimes is directly on the social media. What, what should be, because the HTTPS is specifically for uh, when you're looking at their website, but some folks are now using social media. Right. So in, in, the, in the social media space, I think what what you, would, you need to be alerted to is maybe the type of grammar 
that you're seeing are those sites, right? More than likely, when people have those types of sites, they, they will not make mistakes. Professional sites don't have grammatical errors or typos and that sort of thing. Those are the little things that could jump out at you with those particular um, sites. And then you, you find mainly those sites are the ones that have the pop-ups coming at you. Or there's something called malvertising, where they may put um, they may put a particular ad advertisement on that space. And from the moment you click on that advertisement, what is really happening is that you're in the background, you're downloading a malware or spyware onto your system, right? So those are the little things that it's nothing that is going to be huge to jump out at you, but those are the little things you need to look for, especially on those social media links and shopping sites. I actually did see uh, an in, uh, increase of YouTube ads from China. And you could tell, because sometimes out of curiosity, I, I just kind of check it out. And the English is definitely, <laughs> it's it's a broken version. It's like if they translated it um, using a tool and things like that, I'm just afraid of. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. All right. Uh, and can you just touch a bit uh, on malware? But before we get there, folks, if you're just joining us, thank you. We are here talking about internet scams during this time just before Christmas and um, all these Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales that are happening, you really have to be mindful of what's out there. And this is part of the series for financial literacy and education. And when it comes to malware, what what exactly is malware? Because I've, I've seen it a few times and you know, you have your, your computer may have some sort of antivirus, but how, what should we be aware of when it comes to that terminology without being too technical? Okay. So you have a brand new computer. You have a brand new device, a brand new phone, a brand new laptop, a brand new desktop. It's brand new. You register it. You know, you're now open for business in terms of you're logged onto the internet. You could now do whatever you want. You have your free email accounts, you have, you could go shopping, you could do so many things, but remember the, the device is brand new. So when it came to you it, in that state, it is not compromised, right? However, how does it become compromised? It becomes compromised when you, when you develop your digital footprint. You have your free email, you're browsing any and everything on the internet, right? You start chatting with your friends, sending emails, pictures, having conversations on your, on your device. From the moment you start doing that, you are opening up yourselves to the risk of getting malware onto your devices. Now, it is important that you have a very up-to-date antivirus stored on your device so as to help, help protect you from malware. You have good applications, you have bad applications. And to make it very simple, malware are the bad applications or the rogue applications that could be affixed to your device for the sole purpose of either securing your information or digitally monitoring you so they can get information on you. So here it is, you're having a conversation with your twin sister who's in London and she's sending you a picture of your, your brand new niece. Little does she know that her device has malware and it has been compromised. And that malware has attached itself to that picture she's sending you. So for the moment you get that attachment on your brand new computer, you click on it. From the moment you open that, 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 that photograph and you are ooing and eyeing because the baby is so cute, little do you know in the background, you are downloading a malware on your device. It could be a malware that is for the sole purpose of, of taking any pass with you type in. It could be a malware to make sure that could direct to from the moment you have, do a financial transaction, it activates itself and tries to intervene. It could be a malware for the sole purpose of redirecting you to other sites where other malwares could now affix themselves to the device. So malware is more or less to make it as simple as you said, is a rogue application, not for the purpose of protecting you or giving you anything or doing anything legitimate for you, but for the sole purpose of taking your information, taking your data and probably using it in some bad way in terms of some fraudulent activity or unauthorized activity. Right? That's wow, all. That sounds, that sounds scary. <laughs> uh, and also sounds like it's something that could take your uh, credit card information as well, because 
when you enter your information to purchase something online, then is it possible that malware could then get that information? Well, when it comes to if you're using your, your if you're using your credit card on a legitimate site, as we spoke about before, the HTTPS and the and all of those secure sites, you wouldn't have an issue. But remember, when you go online to do shopping, right? You may have to even if you sometimes you may have to call the particular provider to provide your information, your CCDB, your C, your CDB three-digit number, the back of your card, your 16-digit number. Remember, it is stored somewhere. So it may not be an instance of where they got the information from your device. It could be a case that where you shopped or where you went to, this large conglomerate or establishment that everybody likes to go and shop, maybe they may have a data breach. And as a consequence of that, your credit card information could be part of that data breach. So it doesn't necessarily have to happen on your device, if you understand what I'm saying. All right, yes, but um, to answer the question directly, if if your card number or if your, your passwords could be <clears throat> derived from your device, once you're using that information on a secure website and you have a proper antivirus, I don't think that it is possible, unless, of course, the fraudster socially engineers themselves into your space to, uh, and, and, and you know, put a particular type of malware in your system, maybe another those circumstances, depending on what it is, it may be possible to see your information. Okay. Uh, if you are now joining us, welcome to uh, Straight Off The Bat Live Facebook Live series. And we're here with Antonio having a discussion about internet scams. Uh, we have a couple more minutes to go, so please let us know your questions. And uh, for future insight with events, make sure to follow the Bankers Association of Trinidad and Tobago because... We do these events pretty often, and we want to center it around financial education and literacy. We have a question regarding passwords, because we spoke about that earlier. And it comes from, where can I find it? Oh, here we go. So it comes from Kern. Kern would like to know your views, Antonio, on the use of password managers. Right. So password managers, they store passwords and they create passwords for you but then there's a master key password to get into your password manager so if your device gets compromised and you have to put in that master key somebody could figure it out and then they get access to your password manager right so you need to have a very strong anti-device on your system to make sure that any model any 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 key login type or password type malware that the, with the sole intent of collecting your passwords, you have to have a very strong anti-device on your computer to more or less make sure that doesn't happen. And you could use your password manager system pretty safely. But as I said, here it is, you have a system that stores your passwords or create passwords for you, but there's a master key or there's a master password you need to put in to get access to that. What if your device is compromised and now that master password or master key is in the hands of the malware. So once you have a secure device, you should be able to use that quite easily. So can we uh, continue that conversation as a lot of these uh, phones nowadays, because that's really, let's be honest, where uh, these particular programs are being used are now using your fingerprint. So you have a master um, uh, program to manage all your passwords but then to access it yes you have your password but then you also have a thing your fingerprint do you have any opinions on that what what is your your take on that one i think the fingerprint is a excellent situation and let me explain why outside of the dna testing fingerprint science is the only exact science in the entire world there are no two people in the entire galaxy that has the same fingerprint. Even people who are identical twins, right? Their fingerprints are different. So the only exact science that exists is fingerprinting. So therefore, if, you, if you're using your fingerprint, it should be pretty secure. I'm not sure why, but that made me feel very special. <laughs> well, we all are. 
Very much so, very much so. Uh, for folks out there, definitely let us know your questions because Cyber Monday is around the corner and a lot of us are looking at uh, purchasing stuff for Christmas. Which, by the way, Antonio, if you are a small business owner and you are interested in being part of that e-commerce environment, um, what type of like what's the number one thing a small business owner should be aware of when it comes to setting up uh, and looking out for internet scams um, with purchasing online? Okay, now I guess a small business owner would see would, would, would face the same um, the same type of challenges as everyone else. Now, the, the small business owner is online for the sole purpose of selling their goods. Right now, unless you are selling, selling that goods or service electronically, somebody has to physically appear to collect those items. Right, so you just have to make sure that whatever that what, what, whatever method of payment that person is making towards to, um, getting your your goods or service, that, that method of payment is secure and legitimate. Um, just a step away from the the online models focus a bit. What we know, what we see happening with a lot of small businesses in the country is that persons are going online, ordering goods and services from them, and then showing up and paying with a bad manager's check. Right? So when people see manager's checks, they tend to drop their guard and say, okay, the mere fact a manager's check is present, things are good. But we are seeing an uptick in that regard, where where you have your you have your business online. People are online shopping. They are they, they are putting things in their cart. They're ordering X, Y, and Z from you, and then they somehow tend to get you to agree. Okay, I will accept the manager's check from you, mm-hmm. and someone shows up with a manager's check to pay you, leave with your goods, only for you to go to the bank subsequently to realize, hey, this check is not good. So you are now out of pocket in terms of whatever you sold those people. You've been robbed. That's still an element of online there that I believe a lot of small business owners should be aware of. Yeah. I, I want to close off in, in something that can be a little bit um, <laughs> controversial sometimes, which is cryptocurrency, right? Uh, I have received a few emails um, saying that they have all my information and... I need to pay them in via this, this blockchain account or else it's going to be released. Um, and weirdly enough, it comes from what looks like my domain. Uh, I Because I am a digital native, I, I, the first thing I do is I head over to forums. And like you mentioned earlier, where the social engineering is a copy and paste, there's specific email templates that they use, Right. Uh, so what are we to, how, how do we check that out? How do we make sure that we're not, um, in, in a position that compromise our information? Because for me, I was just like, Hmm, how would they have even got my information? Cause all of my, my business stuff is based on the cloud with Microsoft, uh, solutions. But for, for those out there who may not be in the same situation, what, should they be aware of? Well, based on what you said there, Pauline, it's, it seems as though someone is trying to extort money from you. If they say to you that they have your information and you need to pay them in bitcoins, so as they would release that information. What you're, yes, what that's you're speaking the word. About Sorry, I, I couldn't remember it, but yes, bitcoins. <laughs> right. So what you what 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 is something like there's a softer version of what you call um, when they lock your system and they threaten not to open your system to give you access to your own files, right? Um, which is called is known as ransomware. So what you're speaking about is sounds like a softer version of ransomware where they're threatening to maybe expose or give your personal information or use it against you, right? So the first thing important is that people need to understand that you, not, you cannot put too much of your personal information out there. Now the, okay, the mere fact that you have to, uh, uh, like for example, a free email account, 
you have to give them your name. You, you have to use your telephone number so your personal information is out there right away. And they know where you are. They know which jurisdiction you're in. So anybody could have that information, which is personal information, right? And they may want to maybe say, okay, maybe Pauline is not too versed on the internet so we could scare Pauline into thinking that we could do something with her information. So she, they ask you for Bitcoins. Under those circumstances, Pauline, if you know that you didn't, if there's nothing out there that could harm you in terms of information, okay, let them go ahead, right? You challenge them and say, okay, have a good time with my personal information, right? But in, in circumstances where they ask, where, 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 for example, it is more a little more robust in the context like ransomware, where they actually lock your computer or lock your lock your device or block your or, or, or seize your files from your businesses and that sort of thing. Under those circumstances, it's a little, it's a little more different. And they, and they ask you for Bitcoins in terms of ransom to release, right? Um, under those circumstances, you need to probably make sure and get the best IT folks you could put your hands on to come in there, look at your system and try to get it released, right? Because from the, moment you, from the moment you pay once, they will come at you again and again and again. The best way to protect yourself is to make sure that the, in, the information, your personal information that you have out there is as limited as possible. Very, very limited. So you, if you win the lotto, don't put that on your, on your, on your social media. I, I like what you said there about, you know, it, the, there's just enough or just little enough information for me not to be worried that there's yeah. uh, some level of um uh, harm to come to me with if it is the information is released that's how i feel about facebook i put information mm -hmm. on facebook that doesn't necessarily if you have it or you don't have it it doesn't affect me uh, and i guess that that is a mindset as we we have to think about social media and i've seen incidences where people taking pictures of their the F, 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 a flight ticket to go away, you know? Um, <laughs> so things like that, not gonna yeah, happen. You may, you might see a photo of me coming back, <laughs> which happened to be posted two weeks later. Uh, but we have a question here from Dixian asking, what are the features? Cause you mentioned earlier about the manager's check um, situation. What are the features to look for uh, on the manager's check to ensure that, you know, it is, it is what it is. Well, believe it or not, uh, the fraudsters are more or less so good at replicating, at duplicating, replicating those checks now that the, to the front of the manager's check, to the lower left-hand corner, you tend to see the, the security features. Each manager check would have what the security features are. At the lower left-hand, the bottom left-hand corner of the check, right? So... If you look at that and exactly what they describe to you there, you try to authenticate or, 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 or compare to the item in your possession, that more or less will expose to you whether the item in your possession is good or not. Then to my mind, the bleed through feature because it, with um, manager's checks, original manager's checks, there's a bleed through feature. If you look at the protected, the protected graph at the bottom of the check, you will see the numbers and the numbers, there's a bit of ink Right? When you turn that check around, that ink is supposed to be seen that ink on both sides of the of the of the, of the voucher, not just on one side. To date, the fraudsters have not been able to get the both sides. Right? So that that to my mind is the first visual check you can look at. If you see the bleach ink, but then you may then have to then follow other steps to confirm if the item is good or not. But the key thing here in protecting yourself with these checks is to make sure that you do not release your goods until you verify the check is authentic. As a key thing here. Great advice. Good, good. Um, uh, I know we started a little bit late, so we're gonna extend this a bit because we have a question from Renato. Um, and I just want to be mindful, Renato. Uh, Antonio cannot speak on behalf of all the banks, he works at RBC. Um, so would banks in Trinidad put red flags on your bank account if you do transactions with forex trading and Bitcoin dividend returns? Okay, so, so to answer that. To answer that question generally, once you are in breach of any AML procedures or guidelines as dictated by the CBTT, once your account is being used for any type of fraud or fraudulent activity, that's it. You could consider yourself having some questions to answer. So whether it doesn't matter whether it's Bitcoins, 
It doesn't matter whether it's checks. It doesn't matter whether it's credit card. Once your account is affiliated to any type of AML or fraud-related activity, you could have a problem. Okay. Uh, so the response to that, Renato, is don't be involved in any fraudulent activities. <laughs> and then you'll be fine, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so as we close this session off today, Antony, do you have any final words based on your uh, wealth of knowledge and years of experience in the financial uh, sector in Trinidad and Tobago? What advice would you give folks out there uh, who are now trying to navigate in the online world? What would be the main takeaway you have for them? Okay, the main takeaway is to make sure and outfit yourself with the knowledge you need to protect yourself, right? You need to understand what a safe website looks like. You need to understand uh, where you are in the context of being at, you could be a target. Do not expose yourself to many issues out there. And from the moment anyone brings a financial transaction into any conversation you're having, be mindful that nine out of 10 times that that is fraud. Also make sure when it comes to your digital banking, you have the two-factor authentication function, security function and you're good to go. Safe. Great. And I think with that, we're going to end off the session. Thank you so much, Antonio, for sharing your information uh, and your wealth of knowledge into the internet <laughs> environment that we are all forced to live in right now. Uh, and with that said, I want to thank you all for joining us. Make sure to subscribe to get the know-how and the exclusive insight to our next guest. Uh, we have the link in the comments below. It is uh, bat.org.tt slash Facebook live show. And there you would get an email directly to your inbox. Don't worry, it's a secured email showcasing what we've done so far and who we're going to have as guests for our next session. So just make sure you are careful out there, folks. And um, I'll see you next time for this Straight Off The Bat series.